Okay, about the title, hello everyone. Um, I'm not sure about the title. I have given this title to the um, abstract, but then I changed my mind. So let's say the title reads now something like Master, Slave, and the World Beyond Subjectivity and Objectivity. Okay. And also this abstract is not entirely accurate. I have changed my mind later slightly. Okay. Uh, now, my presentation today will try to provide a possible answer to the question, where does the iconic status of Hegel's master-slave, or as some say, Lord Bondsman dialectic, come from? Why does this short text segment present such a stimulus for endless reinterpretations? Or else, why can't we let go of this image of two individuals caught in the struggle for life? Or ultimately, how come that more than 200 years after the publication of the Phenomenology of Spirit, we still organize conferences revolving around this very scene, this philosophical allegory? Now, my attempt at giving a new rejoinder to these questions is that the master-slave dialectic uh, represents a watershed moment both within Hegel's work and within the larger scope of Western philosophy. And my thesis today is that uh, today will be that this archetypal staging, to call it like that, um, where the master ends the struggle by risking his life, serves to unfold an entirely novel dimension of truth, of truth making, one that is neither simply objective, hence the title beyond subjectivity and objectivity, one that is neither simply objective. Uh, which means striving to correspond to the incarnated order of things, nor simply subjective, hence deriving the constitution of reality from the inner set of, set of concepts or cultural and language forms. As I will try to demonstrate, Hegel invented a new logical space of truth, which is neither an sich nor für uns, neither in itself nor for us, neither out there in the outside world, the great outdoors, as Mersu has put it, nor in here, within the bounds of the idealist subject, the Nietzschean perspective, or the set of social conventions and language games. Basically, neither outside nor in, inside uh, the correlation. Um, instead, it's a truth that requires an event to emerge at all. In our reading thus, uh, the clash between two consciousnesses ending in the symmetry of the master and the slave represents a paradigm of an event in philosophy, an occurrence which is not derivable from any previous principle or state of affairs, but rather changes the game once it takes place. So its eventual character consists in forming a membrane between the outside and the inside world, it, and it is on this membrane that both the metaphysical let us call them objectivist, and the Kantian subjectivist prerogatives to define truth lose their hold. Incidentally, since he's here, let me mention briefly that it is Mladen Dolar's philosophy that cultivates the sensitivity for truth in its probably universal or inevitable dimension to emerge at the logical space, in the logical space of neither nor, hence at the interstice of two massive ontological spaces where both the one and the other collapse. And this is a certain logic that I would like to kind of develop today. Okay, so let us begin and first turn to Hegel's own argument. As we know, the entire phenomenology is propelled by one uh, long striving toward abolishing the dichotomy of the subject and the object. And self-consciousness marks the first provisional endpoint. The three forms of consciousness before that, sense certainty, perception, and understanding, were still caught in the juxtaposition of the two poles, of the I standing against the world, but then understanding, verstand, steps behind the curtain of phenomena, sees the void there, and fills it out itself. And with this, the fundamental uh, dichotomy of German idealism, the subject versus the object, is superseded. So truth has no longer the form of certainty about something other than itself, but instead the only object of consciousness is now the consciousness itself. Or as Hegel puts it, consciousness is to itself the truth, 
or even more, more starkly, uh, with self-consciousness, then we have therefore entered the native realm of truth. Okay. Now, it seems thus that we have accomplished the path of knowledge and have come to the end. And yet, this seemingly successful closure only opens another abyss, one traversed with uh, agitation and negativity. Instead of being happily enclosed in its own self-recourse, Hegel depicts, depicts self-consciousness as a figure of great inner unrest. Uh, of course, already by definition, the Hegelian self-consciousness is conceived as a return from its otherness, from the sensual world, so it can never exist as a pure worldless entity, as some sort of immediate sense of selfness, a Cartesian self-evidence in the intellect and the intellectual intuition of some sort. Rather, self-consciousness is originally processual, reactive, a constant movement of suspension of the opposition between outside world and its own inner hard one, only to be attained identity. This identity is never something given or immediate or pure. It is for this reason that Hegel leaves to the first figure of self-consciousness a somewhat negative name. He calls it the Gierde or desire. Now, this Begirde, Begirde is famously constantly devouring, annihilating, digesting its object, but the more world it eats up, the bigger is the hole in its interior. It is eternally unfulfilled, a veritable image of discontent. So just as Nietzsche named, named the earth a hiatus between two nothingnesses, Begirde, Hegel's Begirde, could be said to be an interval between two voids, the obliteration of the outside world and the growing vacuum of the inside. But why is it that Hegel presents self-consciousness first as begirde, desire? It seems that he needs the eternally dissatisfied, dissatisfied structure of desire to satisfy two conditions. On the one hand, the Hegelian subject is originally placed into the world and can never take off from the ground of earth, so to speak. She cannot withdraw to the Cartesian quiet chamber, rise to the Kantian transcendental deduction, or assume Fichte's a prioristic and unabashed self-positing of the I. Hegel's self-consciousness is rather Heideggerian in the Weltsein, being in the world, a concrete local embodiment fraught with its makel der Bestimmtheit, the stain, the stain of determinacy. On the other hand, it is also essentially a return from its otherness, a movement of sublating its creature conditions, hence something imminently lacking a substantial identity. Not only is it a mere this-worldly entity, or emphatically this-worldly entity, but also less than that or aphoristically stated, in Hegel there exists no other world, but even this world is held together only by, the, by its lack. And Begirde names precisely this, the coincidence of worldliness in its deficit, of pure immanence and something still less than it. In a nutshell, mm, consciousness in the form of Begirde is both pronouncedly mundane and, in a sense, out of place. So it is this lack of an inner Archimedean point to cling to that makes it redouble into two agents, two self-consciousnesses. Begirde is structurally dependent on the, form, on the form of otherness, but it also abolishes every otherness coming its way. So only an entity that itself is endowed with negation, a being harboring the same void in, it, in itself, will possess something that a desire will not be able to swallow. And this entity is, of course, another consciousness. As Hegel says, on account of the independence of the object, therefore, it can achieve satisfaction only when the object itself effects the negation within itself, from which it famously follows, self-consciousness achieves its satisfaction only in another self-consciousness. This is this famous sentence in italic. OK. Um, now. This configuration then leads to the struggle of the two entities that are both self-negating and negating any form of otherness. And since it's not a clash of two simple animalistic desires, which 
would only eat up each other, but of two essentially self-negating beings, it turns out into a battle for prestige, or in Hegel's words, into the struggle for recognition. And the winner is not the one devouring the other and staying alive, but quite the contrary, the one who actually performs upon itself what should have been done to the other. And the more, and the more disposed to accomplish a negation onto oneself, the one, no, sorry. <laughs> and the one more disposed to accomplish a negation onto oneself, the one willing to risk one's own life and their one's own death wins in the end. Or as Hegel says, consciousness must, must show that it is not attached to life. As a, result, uh, as a result, the one going further in waging one's life becomes the master and the one still clinging to the shreds of one's biological life, the bondsman or the slave. Okay, let us end here with this brief recollection. Uh, the story goes on, of course. The recognition is unequal. The master becomes a self-indulgent subject, caught in his own barren enjoyment, uh, while the slave who hangs suspended between his attachment to the empirical world and the withheld recognition from the side of the master um, becomes the hero of the subsequent ascent to absolute knowledge. But let's leave it at that. The question we would like to answer is, uh, what does Hegel really want to convey and produce through this dramatic, almost grandiloquent allegory? What is it that made him invent such a theatrical scene? Now, over the last century, we were witnessing an abundance of analysis trying to answer this very question. There were the Marxist readings, like that of Lukács, the French, of Kojev and its disciples Sartre, Lacan, Derrida, the German of Gadamer, Honet, and others, uh, or the American of McDowell and Brandon, and many, many more. Of course, most of these interpreters could not resist the temptation to place this dialectic into a, let us say, extra-philosophical frame of meaning. They have recognized in Hegel's metaphor either the deduction of the transcendental form of sociality, the establishment of the primary social nucleus, the prototype of a social contract, of the social contract, or a genealogy of domination and bondage. So predominantly, the, interpretation were conduct, the interpretations were conducted in terms of philosophical anthropology, social theory, and history. Um, some have also read it existentially, as an enactment of the human drama of realizing one's mortality and overcoming it intersubjectively, some pragmatically as an account of collectively making sense of and rationalizing the world, some psychologically as a reconstruction of the emergence of the sense of self. But what, in my view, is common to all these readings or most of them, is that they could, brought, could be brought under the, under the denominator of interpretations of immanence. As I see it, mm, the magical X, the never fully accountable surplus that makes us return to Hegel's master and slave time and again, is the fact that it is a story of pure immanence giving birth to its own self-transcendence without invoking any transcendent element be it any religious or normative notion, any kind of platonic or scholastic idea, or any of the pseudo-metaphysical, sometimes almost pseudo-theological concepts, such as Kant's factum of the moral law or Fichte's conscience. Uh, so, in contrast to previous theories of society and subjectivity, uh, this is the tenor of all this interpretation, uh, interpretations, the Hegelian narrative seems to be more terrest sorry, more, yeah, seems to be more terrestrial, more slender and constrained. There is only Begirde and its self-sacrifice, nothing more. So an almost pre-human biological life spawns a sort of uh, self-referential closure in its midst and then this disgorges the rudimentary form of the social bond. This means that Hegel provided an atheist, albeit artistically unusually appealing, account on how the world without gods, without a mythical ideal or metaphysical superstructure, 
can nevertheless produce something well nigh transcendent, namely the miracle of self consciousness and intersubjectivity. However, these are the traditional interpretations. And, however, it seems to me that all these interpretations of immanence, as accurate and justified as they may be, are still somewhat undernourished in the light of the overly stark accents of the Hegelian drama. Uh, in my view, the elements of this dialectic, the, de the devouring of the Begirde, its annihilation of everything, its inner discontent, its redoublement into two, the struggle, the risk of death, the severing of all ties with being, the absolute melting away of everything stable, as Hegel puts it, and the resulting mastership and bondage are motives too excessive, too trenchant, um, to be conceived within the frame of either sociological, anthropological, existential, pragmatic, or subjectivist immanence alone. Immanence alone, yeah. To put it bluntly, um, Begirde, taken merely in its worldly, intersubjective dimension, would probably never come up with the idea of staging the event of its own death. So maybe something else is at work here, something that goes beyond the mere games of mundane interests. In my opinion, we must identify something that is able to gather enough energy to spark off this overwrought theatrics of sacrifice and nothingness in Hegel's narrative. But what might this be, of course? Now, mm, as I will try to demonstrate, um, Hegel is not delivering a story of immanence engendering its own self-transcendence, or he's doing this only explicitly, but not implicitly, uh, but rather a story of the indiscriminately intertwined immanence and transcendence dissolving one into the face, in the face of the other, one in the face of the other, or one into the other, and thereby unfolding a logical space between the two where a different form of truth can come to life. So my, my hypothesis is that what the master-slave dialectic actually intends and inspires for, aspires for is not some positive form of social recognition or human self-awareness, but a new theory of truth. This is, this is what Hegel might have had in mind when he said, it is in self-consciousness, I quote, it is in self-consciousness in the notion of spirit that consciousness first finds finds its turning point, where it leaves behind it the colorful show of the sensuous here and now, and the night-like void of the supersensible beyond, and steps out into the spiritual daylight of the present. So I guess, as this sentence intimates, Hegel's move always consists in collapsing two worlds into one, the sensual here and now, and the supersensible beyond, and truth is the name of this collapse. Um, okay. Uh, now, to support this case of a new theory of truth, of Hegel providing a new theory of truth, two elements could be discerned that seem somewhat underexposed in the interpretations so far. First, it is seldom noticed that in the master's uncanny risk of death, not only an individual stakes her life or his life, but behind this, there is a certain balance of two worlds, two spheres crumbling and being reduced to nothingness. Um, what the known uh, established interpretations seem to forget is that against the background of the progression of the phenomen phenomenology, the entire drama plays precisely at the interstice of the inner and the outer world. Initially, Begirde turns the realm of objectivity into a mere formless mess to be swallowed and consumed. This is, of course, a typical Fichtean move, one of the subjective overpower overpowering of the given world. However, in Hegel, this movement of Begirde, this integrating the order of things, only sets the stage for the breakdown of its inner world. And this is... Mm, uh, this is a very important element if we put uh, Hegel in the context, context of the history of philosophy. As we know, 
uh, German idealism responded to the empiricist Humean dissolution of the metaphysics of substances with Kant's and then Fichte's shift toward the subjective constitution and appropriation of the world. However, this transition from the objective order of things to subjective transcendental forms, this transition only produced another deadlock. The world was placed upon the ground of subjective spontaneity and practical action, but in return, the new subjective idealism only disclosed a certain infinite lack of being within the subject itself. The vertiginous void of interminable tasks, of boundless hunger, and of the perpetual Fichtean drive to act and labor. Now, what is often overlooked uh, in the interpretations of Hegel is that the phenomenology not only tells the optimist story of the pseudo fichtian world usurpation, but also its reverse side. It gives a face to the suppressed discontent at the heart of Kant's spontaneity and Fichte's eye. Or to put it pointedly, where Fichte's eye was artificially delusionary happy, uh, Hegel's Begierde shows that this eye only does not know how unhappy she really is. And I believe the key to understanding the master-slave dialectic is ta to take into account the equilibrium of two processes. On the one hand, the world undergoes a human empiricist desubstantialization. On the other hand, the Fichtean I is forced to, as it were, enact her own symbolic suicide. Uh, when empiricism bereft the world of substances and causes, Kant and Fichte responded with settling the subject with the inner transcendental structure or some etern of, of eternal concepts or with some original practical spontaneous energy. So the deflation of the incarnated world was thereby outbalanced by the inflation of the subject and the leverage was shifted from the one side to the other. But now Hegel recognizes the lopsidedness of this move and tries to, in a way, even it out. Uh, he proposes something much more radical than Kant or Fichte. If the outside world dissolves in its substantial order, he seems to be saying here, then the inside world loses any backing, any firm support, any transcendental claim as well. So the human disintegration of being must be countered not only by the introduction of a spontaneous self-positing subject in the Kantian or Fichtean way, but also by her self-sacrifice. Hence, by the master staging his potential death. In other words, it's not enough to realize that the world offers no resistance to, to its usurpation, which is basically Fichte's claim, but Begirde must also concede that it itself possesses no inner right to do so, no perennial logical forms to impress them upon the world, or no spontaneous original energy that would make the world its own. Mm, and precisely this is what the master accomplishes. He could be imagined as the transcendental subject, allowing a glimpse into his insight and admitting there is literally nothing there. He, in a way, freely admits that he does not carry any timeless table of concepts of, or categories within himself. Or else, he could be seen as the Fichtean I, Fichtean self-positing I, confessing that his spontaneous energy is empty and simulated, or taken on a loan, as could be said. And it is because of this self-exposure that the master effectuates or puts on the stage that probably the master transcends the merely recognitional existential pragmatic scope and touches upon something more, something more basic, namely the new form of truth. In his risk of death, Hegel's master reveals, that, reveals his inner void, his inner untruth, so to speak, and concedes he concedes in a way that he's not an ontologically necessary figure, that he, he may as well be dead and everything else will continue to exist. Uh, he, in a way, enacts his own con cosmic contingency. And with this, he concedes that the, the only truth 
is the one still to be produced in the process that follows. So he, in a way, admits, I bring no own truth into the game in the way that Fichte's eye still has brought it. OK. Mm. Now, that was the first, in a way, overlooked uh, coincidence or condition that probably this, this well-known traditional in interpretations uh, failed to uh, take into account. And the second somewhat neglected layer of this dialectic is that it tacitly performs a break with two most fundamental principles of classical metaphysics, the law of non-contradiction non and the principle of sufficient reason. You know, famously Leibniz in Monodology uh, states that all his reasonings are founded upon these two principles. So to return to Hegel, the entire section of self-consciousness is of course in itself fraught with what the classical thought would perceive as illogical. Begirde wants its object to be and not to be. Life is a unity of opposition, a fluidification of all differences, etc. But it is precisely in the figure of the master that both, trans both transgressions of logic coincide explicitly. In this sense, the logical, um, the logically succinct definition of Hegel's master's master could perhaps read a figure incarnating both contradiction and unreason at the same time. Namely, in his risk of death, the master achieves a fleeting moment of both being and not being, and he does that precisely by way of exempting himself from the causal chain of sufficient reasons to which the slave still adheres. In Hegel's own words, the master must show that he is not attached to life while the slave could not break free from the chains binding him to this very life. Now, this interpretation that here actually tacitly the invalidation of two basic logical laws of classical metaphysics is being, being performed uh, makes sense, especially if we read, uh, if we, if we read the master-slave dialectic in parallel to the beginning of the science of logic which could be viewed as a certain repetition of the struggle for life within the realm of pure logic. Now, both text passages, the master and the slave, and being and nothing, exhibit the structure of an irreducible duality. The one element is essentially not derivable from the other. They originally come in two, and the function of their twinship, two-ness, duality, is that the one directly and without any reason whatsoever negates the other. Just as the master reveals to the slave that there is literally nothing there behind the veil of subjectivity, hence that the logical core of the subject is empty, so the science of logic, so in the science of logic, the non-derivable, non-propositional exclamation of nothing demonstrates to the being that there exists no such thing as an already elaborate logic. There is no structure of innate ideas or transcendental forms behind that could merely be deduced. The nothing as the second category of logic conveys that every other category from becoming to existence, from essence to concept, will only have to be produced in the following process of logical thinking. So in a way, maybe that nothing uh, exposes the same void within the heart of a logical category as the master exposes it within the heart of subjectivity. Okay, now to continue, it is important to define very carefully where exactly does this invalidation of both logical principles take place. And this is the crucial point of my argument. Now the question is, when Hegel, in making the master stake his own life, circumvents the validity of both non-contradiction and sufficient reason, does he do it in order to disclose a completely lawless, erratic, anarchic, contradictory universe? Does he want to let us know that everything in his world, henceforth, is also its own negation and everything can happen at any time? Well, anyone who has read Hegel knows that nothing could be less Hegelian than this. Hegel was, of course, never a romantic who mystified nature or the human soul. 
the tenor of his philosophy is not to endow the given things with ambiguities and absurdities. Far from it. When he, for instance, cast a glance at nature, uh, he never recognized something chaotic, subversive, unpredictable, or inconsistent about it or in it. Rather, he always seems to have been absolutely bored by the prospect of the given world. Uh, he famously called in his conversation with Heinrich Heine, he called the stars the luminous leprosy of the sky. And, his, in, and in his hike to the Bern Alps, he only described it the tedium and the, of the gray stone masses and the unsightliness of the glaciers. Also in Hegel's eyes, the human soul in itself was never something profound, never an irresolvable, romantic or Nietzschean tangle of irrationalities, but rather something shallow and, and, and uninteresting. Um, so what must therefore be stressed is that the principles of logic do not collapse as rules that structure either the facts of the outside world or the ideas and representations within our inner world. Instead, they only break down at the interface between the complete obliteration of the outside on the one hand and the utter sacrifice of the inside on the other. This means that their bracketing, their abrogation, does hold neither simply for the world nor directly or simply for our subjective insight, but only for the domain where the one sphere touches, determines, mirrors, in a word, parallelizes the other. And this is crucial. Even though Hegel could at times be seduced into, um, into staging the world as a venue for real con contradictions, as they are called, uh, for, for instance, in his philosophy of nature, one could perhaps find such moments. His inauguration of contradiction and lack of reason as laws of universe actually never applied to the givenness of either nature or the human soul as such, but only to the laborious, only to, in, a, in a way, only to the moment when the two, the two spheres clash. So only to the laborious process of constructing concepts and truth at that interstice between the two. Um, so the question is, of course, what does the invalidations of the two laws of logic amount to if it occurs at the boundary between the outside and the inside world? As I see it, Hegel's move only serves to break apart the form of truth that fundamentally intertwines the order of ideas with the order of things hence the form upon which classical metaphysics was base, based. Okay. This is probably why uh, one of the ways to probably properly grasp the master-slave dialectic is to read it against the historical background of philosophy, at least against Spinoza, Leibniz, Hume, Kant, and Fichte. Of course, the most full-blown expressions of the law of non-contradiction and the principle of sufficient reason are the two greatest systems of rationalism, Spinoza's parallelism of ordo rerum ontologically coinciding with ordo idearum, and Leibniz's theory of every simple, su simple substance embodying its own complete individual concept, a logic that he developed in, in, in its most... Uh, developed form in monodology. Now, German idealism, to skip empiricism, German idealism tried to re-justify the logical consistence of the wo world within the sphere of the spontaneous free subjectivity. In Kant, of course, both non-contradiction both non-contradiction and sufficient reason were saved, but for the price that the subject itself the very entity who imposes logical order upon things is exempt from their jurisdiction. Spontaneity means exactly that the sub subject of understanding cannot be derived from any previous reason, that it cannot give reason for the way why, why he or she is the way it is, she is. On this basis, Fichte then expressly designed the eye as not abiding by the logic of reasons, he, he, he literally says uh, uh, the eye cannot give any reasons for his appearance. Um, and uh, it breaks, actually, the, the, valid the validity of 
sufficient reason, and he conceived his subject as a unity comprising both itself and its negation, both the I and, no, and the not I. Uh, thus, with Kant and Fichte, the logical guarantees were transposed into the idealist subject, but now this subject failed to account for its substance and its ultimate reasons. Its ultimate reason. And this is where Hegel intervenes. It is in this context that we can probably best understand the reach of his operations. When the design of self-consciousness as Begirde and the master's self-sacrifice reveals what the design of self-consciousness in Begirde and the master's self-sacrifice reveals is the fact that the subject itself is void and possesses no necessary inner forms to still vouch for the correspondence between the logical structure of reason and the ontological order of the world. In Fichte, it was the eye's practical claim that could fashion the world according to his own reason. But in Hegel, this very eye now stakes his, stakes his own life, thereby showing that he's utterly contingent and possesses nothing of, incessity, of necessity inside. With this, Hegel performs an important shift and goes beyond both, both his predecessors. Kant and his Fichte still wanted to make the world reasonable, even if only from the perspective of the subject. So they justify the reason of the world from the point of view of spontaneity and self-positing, a point which in itself has no reasons. Nevertheless, this point is foundational, ontologically necessary, and, let us say, world-making. Hegel, on the other hand, invalidates the logical laws on an entirely different level. He makes them collapse at any intersection where either the given world determines the content of our ideas or our ideas are supposed to synthesize the world of our own. So what Hegel accomplishes with that is a new form of truth which first dissolves any magical correspondence between reason and the world and second, lets the new truth emerge in the events of the clash between the two worlds where concepts and reality enter into a more complex relation than the simple metaphysical parallelisms between the two. So basically, once we had these metaphysical correspondences between the ideal and the real order, then Fichte, uh, then Kant with spontaneity and Fichte with self-positing of the I and positing of the not I, still imposed the logical structure of subject and in the way totalized the world in, into this imposition. But with Hegel, um, where he actually, with, where his operations intervene are no longer these pre-temporal, extra-mundane acts of world-making, he only, he's only interested at every possible clash between concepts and reality, and he tries to resolve the, the truth, the processes of truth taking place there. Okay, if this perhaps now sounds somewhat obscure and sketchy, we could perhaps uh, illustrate the novelty of the Hegelian truth form with an example. Let us take one of the more comprehensible parts of his system, his philosophy of right, and recall the dialectical succession of legal and social concepts, legal, moral, and social concepts, uh, say the transition from property to contract in abstract uh, logic, or perhaps even more so the progression from family to civil society in Sittlichkeit. Uh, as we might remember, the way the family breaks apart on account of the individual leaving its nest and becoming part of the civil society produces an, a contradiction, of course, since the purpose of the family is to give birth to the very individual who causes its demise. In the figure of the free civil subject, it could be said the family most is and is not at the same time. However, this is precisely, precisely not a flat-out real contradiction in the sense that some natural thing, a family, is self-contradictory, but a contradiction arising at the intersection of the concept and reality. While, for instance, the traditional family considered itself to be an organic unity, fully embodying its 
symbolic, almost mythical notion, and thereby securing its endless eternal reproduction, the Hegelian disintegrating family breaks up this organic unity and shows how the real family must perish in order for it to arise as an ideal concept, concept of family, one no longer relying on or ensuing from some natural cosmic order. So what Hegel derives from the sad contradiction of the family being dissolved by its own product is the concept of family which emerges only retroactively on account of its traditional unity of idea and think being sacrificed. Sorry, was this sentence quite... What Hegel derives from the ceremony of family yeah? is the concept of family which emerges only retroactively on account of its traditional unity of idea and think being sacrificed. Okay, yeah. I, I didn't follow my own, my own sentence. Yeah. Um, similarly, Hegel's concept of contract serves to disassociate the concept of property from any feudal traditional notions of inherited lands forming an organic possession of a person, etc. And this is what we mean by the new form of truth. Truth can neither be induced from the outside world, empiristically, nor deduced from the subjective reason, for it simply does not exist somewhere as something given. What is left for philosophy to do is to, is to stage an event, such as an individual leaving her family, or a contract being signed, thereby dispossessing someone of his, of his property. Hence, to stage an event where the traditional concept clashes with its supposed incarnated reality, performs the double sacrifice of both its embodiment and its ideal meaning, and then defines itself anew, this concept, in the process of leaving its initial reality behind. So to draw a line, perhaps this new di dimension of truth that Hegel invented could be described somewhat more formally. Let us provisionally reduce it to three conditions. Uh, first, this truth is not extratemporal and foundational, but rather epistemologically reactive. It never happens in the ivory tower of pure thought. It cannot be simply deduced from a divine mind. It is never given at the beginning, but can only be worked out and acquired in the end. Even Hegel's science of logic, which famously exhibits God's thoughts before the creation of the world, merely depicts a God needing to take upon himself the wearisome path of creating the categories of logic step by step. What Hegel implies here is that the, even God possesses no no a priori logical reason before creating it himself. So the lesson is that there are no laws, no principles or concepts for free. What we are left with is to assume a place within the world which is already symbolically structured and socially and historically mediated, detect its inconsistencies and try to find a way out of its labyrinth. We have to assume the labor of disengaging the ideal order from the real, let the traditional interpenetra interpenetration of transcendence and immanence collapse, and then, on the one hand, release reality from the constra constraint of directly embodying the forms of reason, and on the other hand, set in motion the dialectical redefinition of concepts. In short, we have to redefine them, these concepts, in a way that they can mediate reality but they can only do so if they are not directly derived from it, if there is no, no pre-established correspondence to their embodiments in reality. Okay, this was the first condition. Second, uh, truth is not inductive, deductive, or transcendental, hence not empiristic, not rationalist, not Kantian, but historically evental. Crucial about the Hegelian form of truth is that it cannot rely on any firm, substantial, pre-given frame. Uh, it cannot rely either on the first principle from where everything can be inferred, 
or on a transcendental structure which sets the conditions of everything or a regulative idea to, toward which everything strives. Instead, in Hegel, we are condemned to take a position within the immanence that is always already conceptually structured, and there we must identify its tensions and antagonisms, create an event, and elaborate its consequences. In light of this, the master-slave dialectic is a prototype of such an event, a proto-event, so to speak. And what makes it evental is that it makes both the outer and the inner world collapse, and in doing so, it institutes a non-derivable form, the figure of the master, who will henceforth pose as a no longer resolvable and irreversible benchmark for the future development. Okay, and, the th and third, truth is ontologically minimalist instead of maximalist. Say, the paradigm of a maximal maximalist truth was, of course, classical metaphysics, where the entire created world into its last corner testified to the perfectly calibrated order of ideas standing behind it. With Kant, of course, this total congruence was already tainted, but the subject was still designed to synthesize every single part of its sensual world, and in Fichte, the ideal norm was to make the world's entirely one's own. Of course, Hegel himself was at times not entirely free of this Kantian and Fichtean claim to know and appropriate the world in its entirety, but the very technique of his truth-making functions nevertheless differently. By its very form, it does, this truth does not strive toward the grand ultimate convergence of the subject with the object, but rather stages the spatially and temporally minimal events of truth at which the concept, the concept detaches itself from re reality and gains a more mediate, indirect relation to it. As such, the Hegelian truth is neither derived from a first principle, nor does it set up a normative frame. Rather, it is what I would call a truth that takes place on, upon a membrane. Truth upon a membrane. It occurs essentially on the diaphragm between the two spheres, the outside and the inside, the real and the ideal, and then creates a surplus that can no longer be undone, which is the event. Okay, so to conclude, um, let us now suggest that the struggle between the slave and the master is the, full, is the first full graphic enactment of this reactive, evental, and minimalist truth, one which places the production of truth on an entirely new, new level and severs the ties with the old, either metaphysical or Kantian conceptions. But we can now ask ourselves, what is the advantage, the gain of this truth upon a membrane? What does it bring into play? Can it be deemed implicitly or even explicitly modern? Or, of course, can it teach us something today? A case for Hegel's modernity can perhaps be made if we compare him with some of the philosophers of the 21st century who, uh, who deal with the, with the old logical and metaphysical laws in a remotely similar way as Hegel, but probably with much less care. For instance, in the past 20 years or so, it has become fashionable to advocate a certain ad hoc anti-humanism and declared the world to be a place of utter unreason. Quentin Meassou proposed in his After Finitude an ontology which abides by the law of non-contradiction, but entirely discards the principle of sufficient reason. So he fashioned the principle of, the principle of unreason, irraison, claiming that the only necessity is the one of utter contingency of everything, including the laws, which means that in this world of hyper-chaos, as he calls it, Anything can happen at any possible moment. Mesut then nevertheless advocated the relative stability of things, and he justified this with an argument that has been repeatedly accused of being merely rhetorical and sophistic. We will not go into that. Mm, what we are more, interesti more interested in is that against this backdrop, the Hegelian moves may probably seem more complex and refined. Uh, when Hegel, with, within his systemic dialectic of concepts, 
stages the events which overrule both the non-contradiction and the sufficient reason in the classical sense, he only invalidates them within the range of these events and not outside. He does, he does it in order to demonstrate how the logical consistency of the one realm, say the realm of ideas, is not directly coextensive with the other realm, the realm of, the realm of real things. And what remains of this operation is precisely not an, an image of an erratic, unstable world, a, a, a hyper-chaos of my own sort, but the world no longer governed by the ideal constraints of classical metaphysics. So what can be derived from Hegel's circumventions of, from, from Hegel's circumvention of logical laws is an entirely different image of reality. What he shows is that the old metaphysical conflation of sufficient reasons with causality and of non-contradiction -contradi with things and their relations to other things is only possible in a world where the real order is entirely pre-established within the ideal world order and the ideas constantly intermit and punctuate reality, the way it happens in Leibniz hence in a world designed by the rationalist God. It is, for instance, quite telling, quite ironic, that the most elaborate system of sufficient reason, Leibniz's monodology, is also the one without any real causal interaction. As we know, one monad cannot causally interact with another monad. And, and at the same time, this is the paradigm of a universe of sufficient reason. And in this context, Hegel's break with the classical logic is not about disclosing some intrinsically chaotic world in the vein of Meassou. Oh, I only have one minute. Uh, in the vein of Meassou, and he does not plunge us into the world of embodied paradoxes or something like that. Instead, he performs two operations that are probably much more far-reaching than what the contemporary realists propose. On the one hand, Hegel frees the causality of the world from the Leibnizian inhibitions of determinative reasons, hence from the constant constraints and intermissions of divine ideas. On the other hand, he relieves real things from the ideal form of substances and perhaps even helps disclose the world where relations ontologically precede any stable essential identities. Now, it is of course true that Hegel was not fully aware of the reach and scope of his, his inventions, but it is possible to guess, uh, to guess to which conclusions his thought might have led. So in this attempt at carrying his for work forward, the Hegelian form of truth upon the membrane, the membrane between outside and inside, could perhaps be said to perform two momentous operations. On the one hand, it detaches the metaphysical form of self-identical substances and sufficient reasons from the physical chains of causes, effects, and relations, thus revealing a world not expressing any ideal order, hence the modern world of causality and relationality. On the other hand, it sets in motion the constitution of a system of ideal concepts according to the laws of negation and dialectical sublation. So this is, in a way, these two spheres are now separated. And this is where, in my view, the truest modernity of Hegel lies. Sorry, I actually have, can I have just, just one minute more? I think it's, you know. Okay, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry to cut you that way. Oh, yeah, no, page if it's, 20. I've lost it. All right, but if, now, you, now if it's it. really a finishing thought, Let, go One ahead. minute. Um, this brings this pre presentation to the end. Uh, uh, now, to bring this presentation to the end, the great ambition of the contemporary newer specul speculative realists has been to invent images of the world without man. We have said that the Hegelian, however, we have said that the Hegelian truth occurs neither in the outside world nor within the subject, but upon the membrane between the two, where the one side some, somehow takes the wind out of the sails of the other and vice versa. But lastly, does this mean that the Hegelian form of truth is still humanist, still caught in the, into the correlation of human thought to being? Of course, I would say that precisely not. 
What Hegel shows with his eventual minimalist reactive truth is neither that reality depends on the case on the gaze of man, nor that reality outside this gaze is unattainable in principle. Rather, this new form of truth, although Hegel has only left us with a few clues about this, could be said to imply that cosmic reality can do well without man, but it is truth that requires a membrane at the boundary between the inner and the outer world, where both sides can sacrifice the illusion of possessing any truth of their own. In this sense, the, the Hegelian doctrine may well reveal, may well reveal a more anti-humanist anti -humanist vision of the world as the speculative realists could ever dream of. It namely unveils the world that is neither lawless nor contradictory, but simply possesses no truth and no, knows no truth about itself before it enacts an event where such truth can come forth. It is thus not a world governed by unreason or by contradiction, but a world that must give birth to its truth in the first place. Okay, thank you. That will be all. Mm. Uh, thank you, uh, Jure, thank you so much. I'm sorry if I was a menacing presence uh, over there, scaring you into conclusion. Uh, this was really rich, uh, throwing punches at Kentame Asu, really interesting. Uh, but we only have time for really quick and to the point questions. I'm really sorry, but I'll have to be... I was somewhat over long. No? I, will, I, I will have to be the guy that cuts uh, things, you know, so, so that we keep on schedule. So if someone has a short to the point question, please speak. Francis, you wanted to say something? No, okay. So short and to the point. We do. Thank you for that. I can't wait to, to, to read about this. It sounds like an exciting work that's coming out, uh, very intense and, and super high level, so thank you. Just wanted a super quick question is, um, the point where you said several times that the master is at, uh, puts himself at the risk of death, but in the narrative and the phenomenology of spirit, Hegel doesn't name the master yet at that point, has that sentence speaking and naming the master uh, as er, after the struggle to death. So there's a moment when there's a struggle to death without the naming of mastery. How do you think about that in relation to your argument? That in fact, do we need the master to be named? Because once the master is named, his relationship isn't to the struggle for death, but to the enjoyment of the, uh, of the labor uh, that the servant produces. So I always think of the master as a figure of enjoyment and sort of might or might that not have a different inflection for what you're thinking about? Oh, but the result of the struggle is the, the constitution of two figures. So the one severing the ties with his biological life becomes the master. And the fact that he is not named before, where, what's the problem? I, I don't see it. I mean, well, I, I, I'm not sure. Because where, he's not named, mm -hmm. he's not a master, he's not named, so if, I mean. It's, it, I could call it a giraffe. I mean, why? What? <laughs> you see what I mean? Like the name yeah. for Hegel, and that's part of his discursive idiom is to sort of do something and then finally name it. So I think you could argue well, retrospectively that that's the master all along. You mm -hmm. could argue retrospectively oh, that's no, the no, master I, all along. I, but I, I, I was probably slightly inaccurate. I don't think that there was a master all along. I, I conflated and uh, um, or <laughs> somewhat shortened the narrative in the way that. The, the consciousness that later became the master is the one that before that, of course, um, uh, sacrificed his life, his life. But I'm not sure what, um, where are you going with this? What's, uh, well, just because the, I think enjoyment is a different uh, form of being than it, risking yourself at, you know, putting yourself at risk for death. I mean, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, uh -huh. you know, so if the master is he who is predicated on the risk of death and is then named afterward as he who is the one who enjoys, I feel like those are different constructions. No? Okay. No, but first, some things are quite clear in Hegel. There are two consciousnesses. There's the one staying attached to life, and there's the one uh, presenting his willingness to risk death. And the, the other becomes the master. I'll, 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 okay. I'll have to agree with Andrew yeah. here. I think there are two stages. The first mm -hmm. stage, yeah, yeah. it's unclear. 
it could be uh, like he talks about uh, two consciousnesses, yes, yeah. self consciousnesses with, that go at each other, mm -hmm. but it's not clear that none of them will die. Like both of them might die. Like it could be a meeting of two masters if we already had that concept. Like it's only in the next stage that we have like the separation uh, of the 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 Herr und Knecht simply because both yeah. of the both of the no, people no, survived. True. The, so it's a, it's a, it's the like master and the slave a are, the, are the outcome, not the original names for the subjects caught in the struggle. But um, if Okay, that was a conflation on my part. But if, we take that, if, we, if you take that out of the equation, uh, what's the problem there? I mean, I don't, I don't see it quite. Well, the problem is because it's mm. the words on the page and the way in which Hegel presents his narrative in an order. I mean, we'll just uh, you know, have a different perspective on that, but Hegel's form is disclosive in that way. Uh, you finally figure out what he's saying when you arrive at a point where he tells you what it is. And I think that, I think for you, in your, de in your mm -hmm. defense, or to say it on your side, is that there is a retrospective force, there's a retrospective kind of reading that you can do from the point of naming the master to the point where the master is not named, but yet is an entity struggling to the death or putting himself mm -hmm. at risk of death. I, I would, that's a fair conclusion too, but I just wanted to yeah. kind of sort out it's really a question about the narrative and the ordering of the presentation and how much would you want to conflate or how much would you want to kind of follow the order of the presentation? Actually, I was interested more, I was not, not that interested in social bond or mastery at all. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, have, I probably it would be more accurate for me to say uh, the consciousness risking its life and leaving the master out of it entirely. Okay. Okay, we have... But, we have... but the, within this, the okay. argument probably stands. We have another so, quick and to the mm -hmm. point question, so let's try to squeeze it in. It's a very simple question. I, I just, I, it's a very evocative word, membrane, but I don't know what you mean. Uh, I don't know what a membrane. 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 You keep talking, invoking membrane. Okay, maybe membrane is another unhappily <laughs> chosen word. Um, I've, I've, um, I have tried to, you know, place. Um, uh, Hegel against his predecessors, like uh, the metaphysicians had some form of truth, Kant and Fichte some other form of truth, and then the Hegelian truth is not an uh, extra mundane world-making event of encapsulating everything in a certain order. It's, um, uh, his logic dif uh, works differently. He looks for the moments of antagonisms and produces there some Anstrengung des Begriffs, some effort of the concept, you know? And, uh, okay, I, I could say at the interstice between the two worlds or uh, at the, what's the other word? Interstice or intersection of both worlds. And then I have chosen the word membrane. Maybe the membrane was um, as unhappily chosen as the master. <laughs> but I don't know, do you have a problem with the logic of this interstice? Or, or just the word? No, it, it seems like it's, again, it's a placeholder for a problem okay. um, and not a solution to a problem. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, I, I, I've said the, his truth is minimalist and I want it to something uh, as a metaphor, some object that is kind of ontologically minimal, which is a membrane. But you're saying That's that all. history, mm -hmm. the, uh, history happens in the membrane. In other words, it's almost as if the membrane is the locus of both you know, ideational transformation and the establishment of you know, what is the case. I, I don't quite follow. Yeah, um, okay, it's my mm -hmm. confusion about, you know. Mm -hmm. the, this is what happens when one wants short and to the point questions. We don't really understand each other, I no, suppose, the, so the well. membrane is simply a metaphor for these um, minimalist events of truth that are never extra mundane and never encapsulate the world into some vision of, of reason or something like that. Okay. Uh, there's one more that I'm going to allow, one more uh, quick and to the point question. Gentlemen, can you raise the hand? Yes, uh, you've been seen. Um, this is this was really a wonderful paper, and there's so much to talk about. Um, yes, I, I'm sorry <laughs> about my answer. If yeah. truth is evental and processual, mm -hmm. is there a subject to the process, as Althusser famously claimed, critiquing Hegel? 
is, is a subject. Is there a subject to the process, as Althusser famously claimed, criticizing Hegel? Um, well, this is, in a way, the process of subjectivization in Hegel, as I see it. So the Hegelian subject is not precisely not a Kantian. I, I'm not sure I'm, I, I, I'm really answering your question, but um, the Kantian uh, subject is the one of conditions of possibility. And Fichte is one of this world-breaking event at the, uh, at the beginning of self-positing. But with Hegel, Hegel in philosophy of right defined the subject as the series of his actions, which are small events, let us say so. So in a way, this, um, this distillment of this minimalist moments where Hegelian truth happens are, of course, um, levers which subjectivate or create a subject. Okay, I will we'll have to we'll have to accept that as, mm -hmm. at face value. I'm really sorry to ha to have to be the person that kills the discussion, but I'm going to do it with some dignity and pleasure. Uh, uh, yes. Thank you, <laughs> thank you, Jure.